The Dreadnought acoustic guitar, first created by C.F. Martin roughly a hundred years ago, has come to be perhaps the most familiar and widely recognized style of acoustic guitar, and it may arguably be the most popular style of acoustic guitar. This video is about a not-so-common member of the Dreadnought family, a 1972 Martin D35S. <laughs> for visiting another Gray Picker channel. A short while back, I made a video about moving from steel strings to nylon strings. And in that video, I mentioned I would uh, make a video about this specific guitar. This is a Martin D35S. Uh, so I thought I'd tell you a little bit about how I came to acquire the guitar, uh, show you some of the features of the guitar, talk about dreadnoughts, of which this is a member of the dreadnought family, uh, and then give you a few uh, audio samples that you can hear uh, the sound of the guitar. For those of you who may not care to hear the story and may want to move more to the details of the guitars, I'll put some uh, time marks in the description below so you can jump to whatever interests you most. The summer of 1972 in Atlanta was pretty hot and happening summer. Uh, Major League Baseball was in town for the All-Star Game. Uh, one of my favorite performers, Stephen Stills, was coming to town. Didn't know it at the time, but he was bringing a band uh, called the Nassus, which ended up being just a great, great band. Uh, so it was hot times in Atlanta. In fact, we called it Hot Atlanta. Uh, Allman Brothers had given us that, and they were close around town at that time as well. That particular summer, I was moving from my junior to my senior year in college and working during the summer to help pay uh, for my college education. Uh, I had been playing guitar for Oh, about 10 years at the time, started when I was 12 years old. And I um, always played imports, silver tones, echoes, uh, nice enough guitar, but not a serious instrument. And I had gotten to the point where I felt like I really wanted to get into a first class guitar, something that uh, I could stretch out on, learn for on, and, uh, and have for a good while. So um, my budget was a little low. <laughs> as you can imagine, uh, $300, $325, which to me was big, big money at the time. Um, and in that price range, the guitar that I was most attracted to uh, was the Ovation Balladeer. Some of you may be familiar with the Ovation Balladeer. They had a rounded or bowl-shaped back that was made from a composite material that had been developed by the airline industry. And they had a reputation for just having great, great plugged-in sound very natural uh, sort of pickups in them. Um, and they were kind of pretty popular. Uh, Glenn Campbell was the celebrity endorser for uh, Ovation guitars. And regardless of, of your taste in music, uh, I think you'd have to admit that there are probably very few more skilled pickers than Glenn Campbell was. So, so you know, I was looking at that guitar, had looked around many of the uh, stores around Atlanta, what few there were at that time. Uh, but there was a great store in the west end of Atlanta called Jackson Music that was close to where I worked. And it had a great slogan that was on a sign outside the store that said, even the richest child is poor without a musical education. And I guess that's pretty hard logic to fight. Now, Jackson Music's specialty was more band instruments and, and student instruments and that type of thing. But it was close by, so I thought I would drop in and see what sort of guitars he had. Um, and I was surprised to see this particular guitar hanging on his wall. Uh, he asked me, he agreed to be very, very friendly, and you know, asked me what I was looking for and sort of what range I was in with it. And I, and I explained that to him. He said, well, why don't we pull that guitar there off the wall and let you play it a little bit? I thought, I can't afford it, but I'm not going to turn up an opportunity to play a Martin, even if it's only for a few minutes. Uh, so we did. And, and of course, I just fell in love immediately with it. And he could see that, he could see on my face how much uh, I enjoyed the guitar. And so he asked me, he said, can I wrap it up and take it home? I said, Mr. Jackson, you know, like I explained to you, I wish we could, I really love that guitar and I'd love to have it, but I can't afford it. He said, what if I made you a really good deal on it? I said, well, you know, that would have to be some sort of super deal. He said, I'll tell you what I'm gonna do. 
I'm going to give you that guitar for four hundred dollars. Goodness, why so cheap? And he explained to me that he'd had the guitar sitting there a while, and because it had a twelve fret neck and a slightly wider nut on it, that most of the rock and roll players and folk players, like I had been, just simply weren't uh, interested in a guitar that uh, had that that type of neck on it. I don't know, that's just crazy. Cause I at that time was moving from being just a sort of a campfire strummer into being more of a guitar picker, a uh, finger picker. And I thought, oh God, that, that guitar would be perfect for what I want to do. And I thought, can't say too long, but, but I thought hard about it. And thought, I'm going to find some way to make up the difference. And so on that day, uh, Mr. Jackson wrapped it up and I brought it home. And it's been with me ever since. And I'd like to tell you uh, a little bit more about uh, the history of Dreadnoughts. Take a look at this one, what makes this somewhat of an uncommon dreadnought, and then give you a few sound files that you can hear uh, sound on. I wanted to take a moment to look with you at a little bit of dreadnought history. In the early 20th century, Martin Guitars supplied guitars for Ditson, and this picture we're looking at here includes three of those early 20th century Ditsons, with the one on right being the model referred to often as the extra large. You'll see that it has sloped shoulders, a 12 fret neck, and a slotted peg head. I'm going to include a link in the description of this video below for a really good detailed overview of the Ditsons and the birth of the Dreadnought. Soon, however, 14 fret necks began to dominate. And in this picture, you see an early 50s D28 with a square shoulders in the 14 fret neck that so many folks have come to associate with the Martin Dreadnought. This is a picture of an early 40s Gibson J35, another early sloped shouldered guitar, which you'll note it has a 14 fret neck. As finger picking has become a much more popular style of playing, most manufacturers have begun these days to offer similar models. Now, this is a Collins, and you'll notice that it is almost identical in appearance and features to the early Ditson and into this current D35S. In 2016, Martin produced the D222, which I have a picture of here. This is a reproduction of the early first Dreadnought, or the Ditson Extra Large, that we looked at just a few seconds ago. Now, we'll take a closer look at this D35S from 1972. According to Martin's records, this guitar came out of the factory in January of 1972. The top is Alaskan Sitka Spruce. The bridge and the fretboard are ebony. It has a 12 fret neck. The headstock is mahogany, which is stained to match the rosewood. You can see that there are slotted tuners, and these are Grover seal tuners with a 14 to 1 tuning ratio. And the nut is a 1 and 7 eighths inch nut, a little bit wider than uh, standard dreadnoughts and a little bit narrower than uh, the normal classical guitar nut. I lived for a few years in the latter part of the 1980s in the Rocky Mountains, and in the dry climate there, the original black pit guard uh, basically just peeled away. So rather than have it put back on, I had my luthier out there put on a tortoiseshell pit guard, uh, just more appealing to me, and uh, had the look like an, a D45. Later on, I added bridge pins with abalone insets. The back is the traditional D35 three-piece back, and the story goes that in the 1960s, while Brazilian rosewood was still being used in production as, and was becoming scarcer and more expensive, uh, Martin decided to move to the three-piece back option so that they could use smaller pieces of rosewood and get more use out of the stock and less waste. And, of course, that's become the D35 signature is the three-piece back. And the back and the sides are East Indian Rosewood. This is a 72, so it was four or five years uh, after Martin stopped using the Brazilian Rosewood. The neck is mahogany, one piece, 
One interesting feature of the S models, at least in this time frame, was that Martin did not put a truss rod in these necks, and they shipped with light gauge Martin Marquis strings, and I suspect that was in part due to the diminished stress that the light gauge had over the mediums that were probably the more normal string at that time. And as you can see, after uh, 45 plus years of play in the neck shows a little bit of the uh, wear on the back. And you can see predominantly where my hand position has been over the 45 plus years. In the first year that I had the guitar, I had a Barkus Berry flat response audio pickup early sound transducer installed in the guitar and that stayed there for a long long time about seven or eight years ago i had uh, that taken out and the k and k mini put in take advantage of the improved technology in that time over the life of the guitar there have only been two structural problems that we needed to address in 2006 factory authorized technician reset the neck and I also had him at that same time refret the instrument as well. Then in 2009, we had a factory replacement of the ebony bridge. Now I'd like to give you a few examples of how the guitar sounds, and I thought I should tell you a little bit about how we're recording it so it can kind of inform uh, your listening. So I'm recording straight into microphones, no jacking into uh, uh, processes or anything. I have a Zoom R8 recorder, so I'm picking up one of the onboard mics on it. Uh, and then I have an AKG condenser microphone here that's pointed uh, towards the uh, bridge area. Uh, so we'll have two mics going. Um, I am not playing phosphor bronze strings, which is what I played throughout most of the life of this guitar. But as a concession to getting a little bit older, I've moved to uh, what they call phosphor and silk strings. So it's a little bit lighter tension, and you may want to just know about that. To, uh, as you're listening, kind of judge how the sound is coming through to you. I'm going to play you a little bit of uh, Harrison's Here Comes the Sun. Uh, general heat capos up to the uh, seventh fret. I'm just going to play it on the fifth fret because I need a little more territory in here with the 12 fret neck. Um, but I thought I'd play something up in the high register so you can hear what that sounds like. <laughs>
piece from the birds. Uh, I'll feel a whole lot better. Mm -hmm. 